So, yeah, my name is Shamalik, I'm a software engineer in Red Hat, and I have a question. Who writes software? Who is a developer, software engineer, <laughs> writes horrible share scripts? Excellent. And I'll, I'll be commenting on you. And um, who runs it in production then? All right, also eight people. I'll be also commenting on you. Um, so let's start with developers. Um, what developers do, what they want? So if I'm developing something, I don't want to write everything from scratch. So I need to search the internet for <laughs> things that are useful to me. And this will be libraries, this will be whatever things. And I don't really care that much, like where they come from or how supported they are. I just like need to make my work really easy and then off we go. Um, is that about right? Maybe I'm just a horrible person. But I'm <laughs> I, I have no exclusivity comic, I'm sorry. But operators, so I think you look like pilots. And if you run something on production, again, there will be dependencies, there will be things, but you probably prefer packages, you probably prefer auditability, life cycles, <coughs> and some kind of support. You so, not to sleep at night. And not to sleep at night, that's also a very, very good point. So, you might notice something really impractical in these two groups. They are very different. They just need completely different needs, but they somehow need to work together because the software goes from the developer to the operator and they somehow need to work together. So how to make them both happy? Um, so there's a question, isn't this just packaging? So that's what Linux distributions do, right? There are packages that you can just install very easily um, let, 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 let's have a look what, if, that, if that's all right. So packaging, that makes software um, uh, integrated, tested, updated, and easily installable. So when I started with Linux, that's 12 years ago already, I went from Windows XP, and that was quite of magical because I didn't have to search the internet for anything I wanted to install. It was just something, something, install this, and it just magically appeared. That was amazing. And I got updates, sure, and it always worked. That was, that was really nice. And there is a lot of work um, coming into distributions that make sure that everything works together nicely, um, everything is tested, updated for security issues, etc., etc. So packaging is great. And then there's a second thing with Linux distributions. I didn't really care about this that much back then, but Life cycles, I said that brings over time stability to the diverse open source world. What I mean by that is I actually have a picture. So imagine that this is, this is not the whole open source world, right? There are more than seven projects, there are like millions, but they're different, very different. Um, this is just life cycle, this is just the maintenance timeline and just one version of an application appears and then another version of the application appears and it dies. No one cares about it anymore, no one maintains it. And if you run something in production and you need to somehow make sense of everything, that's crazy. So how to fix this? Well, Linux distributions came into play and they somehow picked a few. They just magically changed the life cycle because they care for it in a certain period of time. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter, but it's the same. And very conveniently, they just put it together and release it as distribution releases. I can see Fedora 27. But there are 28, and it's just like everything works nicely. And of course, there are many Linux distributions out there. I can see CentOS, which is like a long time. Um, not support, maintenance, whatever. Fedora, every 13 months, there's a new release. Or something like Arch Linux, there's basically no release. It just sort of happens. New versions appear as they, as they do. And there's a big variety. You can basically choose what you want, and that's great. So that sounds really good for operators, sort of. Um, packages, life cycles, update, transparency, I can see everything in there. But there's a one problem with it. It's kind of monolithic, right? Everything's the same. Every piece is in just one version. And it might be inflexible. Probably not for developers, and sometimes not even for operators, because even existing applications might need something different. So let's, let's have another question. What about containers? Do they make both groups happy? Um, 
So containers are these isolated and portable things, right? Like these raspberries. Imagine a pile of raspberries that's like the upstream, and then we can put it in boxes and just we can sell it nicely, ship it nicely. So this is basically containers. But how would this look like after a week or three? <laughs> right? So containers are great, but they're just isolated and just portable. And they won't somehow magically fix the software in them. And this is nicely visible, I can see, but well, whatever. So they're great, but they might not be the answer to this very question. So what we actually need, so we need new versions and variety of versions for developers, but with the qualities for operators, system administrators, how, uh, how, how to do that? So there is a project called Fedora Modularity, um, which I'm working on for some time. And I have stickers, if you like, hex stickers, <laughs> um, because that's important, right? Um, and what we do, modularity basically separates the life cycles of different pieces of a Linux distribution. So, life cycles. We care about life cycles. We care about the maintainability. We care about the stability and sometimes support if you have a commercial distribution. So let's have a look at this image again. That's what we saw. This is the maintenance. So what's inside? This is a little bit simplified version of Fedora with just no JS package, nothing else. And as you can see, there's Fedora 26 and Fedora 27. These are quite old versions, but I have them for demonstration purposes. Just there is a different version of Node.js. There is a 6, and there is Node.js 8, nothing else. So what happens with modularity, it's somehow, somehow what we did in Fedora 28, we introduced so-called modules, and I'll be talking about them. And they give you choice of a version. So you can somehow choose what you want. And then when there is a new release coming in, it just somehow, you can somehow keep it and, <coughs> and everyone's happy. By the way, this is a lie. Um, we're not making portable binaries, it's more like this. So this is a different binary, but with the same promise, right? With the same version, so Node.js 10, Node.js 8, whatever I want, I can have. <coughs> so before I show you a demo, uh, I'll have a drink. And then, I'll have a, then we'll walk through four concepts that we're using in modularity, and then we'll have the demo. So packages. Distributions are built out of packages. Everything is packages. And we're not changing anything in this regard. We don't even basically touch them. They're the same. Um, what's new here is modules and streams. And naming is hard, so I apologize. But modules are some kind of logical groups of packages representing an application, language runtime, or something that just makes sense. And we can somehow take them and put them on independent lifecycle. So as we could see, they could live throughout multiple releases. And then we have this thing called streams, which are something like version, but we have mo more streams of compatible versions. So for example, versions of Node.js 10, versions of Node.js 8. And I can choose any one of those, so there they will be multiple available. So that's modules. And then when we have so many choices, we don't want to get crazy about that, right? I don't want to choose every single component of the operating system. So we have defaults, and that means that you need to choose only when you want to. And if you don't care, just everything works as before. You will only see one version. That's fine. But if you want to change, you can change. And when you do choose something, it's very important that updates won't break everything. So you say, I want version 8. And then you run update. You get the latest 8, but you won't get 10, even though it's available. So this is very important. You get updates, but just within the stream you chose. All right, demo. Um, I really like live demos, and I don't want to ruin their reputation, so I'll do a recorded demo. What do you think? <laughs> um, all right. Before I start, um, who uses Fedora or an RPM-based distro? All right, so we use this package manager called DNF. It, was, it used to be called YAM. And that's how we basically install software, and it's important. It'll be command line, just showing some new commands, how to manage the modules. Um, all right. 
So I'm typing DNF module list, and that shows me the list of all the modules available after I hit enter. There we go. And I'll be focusing on Node.js in this example, so I'm highlighting two versions right there, Node.js 8, Node.js 10. And this is Fedora 20 in beta, so there might be some content missing, but for the demonstration, that's, not, that's fine. I choose to install Node.js 8, so I type the command dnf module install Node.js <laughs> colon typo 8. <laughs> and I have a lot of time, so I'll wait for a while, and then I hit enter. I say yes, I really mean it, excellent. And then I'll wait for the internet to connect. There's an impressive Wi-Fi here. Um, oh wait, that's a recording, never mind. All right, so I have Node.js 8, and if I type node-v, I can prove there's Node.js 8. It's where I expect it to be, it works the way I need it to be. Everything's great. I'll try update, just to demonstrate that it won't break, even though there was 10 available. So very slowly DNF, update Node.js. Nothing happened. I have the newest version because I just installed it. But I could have got an update for V8. All right. Let's switch it to 10. Now I'm making the choice I really want to upgrade to 10. So I type DNF module install. It's the same command. Node.js 10. And it should ask me if I want to really do this. It's a switching stream from 8 to 10 over there. And, yay, I got 10. So again, node-v, and I'll see. I said node-v. <laughs> Thank you. And it's 10. All right, so that was managing streams. And there's a one thing that I haven't mentioned. It's sort of a bonus. So if I have an application, I can sometimes install it in multiple ways, like a database. I can install the server, I can install the client, or both. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate here as well. So I'll do the list again. <coughs> and I need to find a database. There we go. I found MongoDB. I can see client and server. There's also something called default, which is a little bit ambiguous. I think we're getting rid of it, but just ignore it. And now I type dnf module install the module name so it'll be mongodb colon the version and slash profile and I'm just installing the server portion and I don't have to care which packages are that because there are so many packages in there so that's why you're trying to make it easy I just want to get the server whatever the package is alright installing And just to show it's really there, I just type mongo tab tab and that'll be it. I have mongod, which is a daemon, and something else, which I don't know what it is because I'm not a database person. Um, okay. And if I decide I want also the client, I can use the same command, but I change the server to client. So I just de delete the server part, type client. And I get even more packages. So with the profiles, these are just package subsets, so I can install one, two, all of them, or I can just choose packages manually. That's, that's also doable. So this is really just a bonus to, to make it easy for, for people. There we go. When I, again, just mongo, tap, tap, and I'll see that there. Uh, things like Mongo tools and other interesting things. All right. So that was the demo. Um, that was for the modularity, um, multiple versions of packages in Linux distributions. So that was, I hope, interesting. Um, so containers again. I was a little bit hating on them, so let's, let's fix that. Um, let's have a look at containers for their true benefits. 
they run almost everywhere, and I can do the compose and testing up front and then just ship it to production. So let's just use them for what they're good for. Let's not shove things in there and just like let them rot, but let's just use them what they're good for. So this is great, and basically it's so easy to make them that they are third-party repos, and I can just go to them, find a container, and run it, right? What could go wrong? Um, oh. um, this is an oldish article like half a year ago, but it's, it has an interesting quote in it that someone was pushing containers into Docker Hub, but it could be any registry, right? And they were functioning fine, but there was this script that was mining something on your system, and they made quite a lot of money. So, um, so yeah, back to containers. Let's just use them for, that, for what they're good for. So if we have modules, if we have the software, we can just build custom containers with Linux distributions, right? And we can leverage both. So the lifecycle benefits and the packaging benefits with the container benefits, with the portability and isolation. And I don't have a demo here, but I have just a slide just to demonstrate it's super easy. So this is a Docker file, like three Docker files. And I can do from Fedora 29. And the command we saw, dnf dash y means yes. Module install no GS8 or no GS10 or no GS11. And then dnf clean all to just clean the metadata to make the <coughs> image smaller. And that's how I can make very easily my own container and I know what's in there. And what's nice about it, if I need an update, I just rebuild it and I get the newest versions. So I get security updates and whatever. So there we go. All right, so if I somehow run everything, well, we saw the multiple versions and then we can see how we can run it in containers. So if I run everything containers, what about the operating system? Do I need to care? Um, well, I, I, I think I should definitely care for security reasons, performance, hardware, etc. But it doesn't need to be my pet. In a sense, I don't need to care which packages exactly are on the system or I don't need to install individual things on it. But it can be immutable. And we have two projects in Fedora. Someone could already heard about CoreOS. We have Fedora CoreOS and Silverblue, and these are immutable operating systems for containers. Um, CoreOS is for your server, and Silverblue is for the workstation. And what's kind of interesting in them is the way it upgrades and the way you can manage it. So if I look at traditional upgrade, and this is not Silverblue or CoreOS, this is just a traditional distribution, right? And I want, let's see, this is the system, and I wanted to update it from orange to green. So what happens? Um, well, the packages start updating, right? One by one, and the mo system modifies itself underneath. And then I'm done, and hopefully nothing broke. And if it did, in the middle, I can be in some weird state, which I would need to recover from. But <coughs> if, I, if I have a look at the RPM OS3, um, or at the Silverblue and CoreOS, which use technology called RPM OS3 to manage the system, what I do is that I download a new image on the side. So this is like a new system, and I just reboot in it. So there's just much less, um, much less way this can break. And this can be from like major release to major release, or Fedora 28 to Fedora 29, which I did like during the lunch break, major distro update, but I didn't quite care. Because if something breaks, I can go back. And you can go as crazy as like from Fedora to CentOS. As long as the configuration files are compatible, there's no problem with that. So yeah, basically fearless upgrades. That's great, CoreOS, if you're on a server somewhere. Yeah, I have a question. What happened to Atomic? Is Superblue an evolution of this? So uh, I have a question. What happened to Atomic? Um, if you heard Project Atomic, that was a Fedora initiative to basically do the same thing. And yes, CoreOS is, and Superblue is, basically a new version of Atomic. So when Red Hat acquired CoreOS, they basically, it came also to Fedora, right? And they took like the best from both worlds. So for example, RPM OS3 is from Atomic, and CoreOS, like the brand, or other technology, they have a lot of interesting automation in there. So that came from CoreOS, and they somehow making it, everything work together. Yeah, so that's like a next generation. 
And yeah, so this is kind of useful if I want to have a server and I need to make sure it always boots if I update it. So I can just switch the image. If it doesn't work, I can just boot the old one. And with server blue, it's great for experiments sometimes. Um, I can just try new versions or I can just make, make sure that it always <laughs> works or I can go back. All right, that was quite quick. So if, I, if there are three things I want everyone to remember from this talk, um, I think it will be these three. So Linux distributions, um, we saw Fedora modularity, and they're great for packaging and lifecycle. Um, then we can take that and build containers with Linux distributions. And there are tools like Builder and Podman to help you with that. And yeah, containers are just portable and isolated. So that's what we need to keep in mind. And then if we have everything in container, we don't need to care that much about the OS, but we still need to care a lot about the OS. So that's why we have immutable operating systems like CoreOS and Silverblue having fearless upgrades in them. And you can follow me on Twitter. Um, all right, that's everything I had on the slide. And now we can have questions or I can show you more demos or whatever. And yes? Okay. <coughs> so you started by, well, uh, some history. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 2000 uh, and 2010, when uh, Linux uh, started to be used in production, there was some promise. Uh, you get into your system, everything is packaged, you do uh, uh, you install or DNS install, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was uh, such a great thing for end users. Uh, it even made it made into a marketing uh, uh, motto. Uh, Linux uh, battery included. Uh, you don't need to go to X uh, different optional uh, things like on the proprietary Linuxes. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, uh, you had uh, the middleware of the time like Apache. Uh, directly inside your Linux distribution as a package like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, when on other systems it was an add-on, optional add-on or whatever, not really well integrated. Mm -hmm. So today's middleware is uh, something like uh, Elasticsearch that uh, everyone here uh, has to run somewhere uh, if he has a modern uh, information system. Mm -hmm. So Elasticsearch, what it is, it has it uh, has a Java core, it has a great, a nice, uh, modern GUI in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, they've been adding uh, some uh, bits uh, in uh, Golang, and then uh, to wrap it all together, you usually have uh, Ansible or something else <laughs> in uh, Python. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you showed us how to install uh, developer-oriented models, Node.js uh, or whatever. Uh, if I do uh, install me the uh, Elasticsearch model, how do you compose all those developer-oriented uh, screens into something which is useful in production, not in development, but in production? Mm -hmm. um, for you, for your dev or <laughs> All right, that's a good que that's a good question. So, how I basically um, install something complex for developer, and so you need to think about developer of what, right? When I in no, I, I'm just uh, end the uh, Linux user. I want my elastic so. Right. Oh, I need to repeat the question for the recording. So, basically. The question was, um, if I try to make it shorter, um, how do I install Elasticsearch f as a developer uh, uh, a complex, with this? Uh, a complex application. application that uses a, a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. stacks. Yeah, so how, how do I install a um, complex environment that's using a lot of developer stack like Python, Elasticsearch, and other languages maybe mm -hmm. at once? Well, if they're packaged in Fedora, you can just type the same command, so DNF install Elasticsearch. Yeah, but how does modularity help? Oh, how does modularity help? So if there are multiple versions that are actively used, there might be multiple modules that you can actually choose from. But that's basically, that's basically it. It won't 
somehow change the packages if you want to make the development of the Elasticsearch, right? Yeah. Beto is saying, yeah, you can have a you can have a stack module. So just for the user experience, you can take multiple modules and just like wrap them into one, if that's desired. If it's like a really common thing, so that's like a meta module. That's what you can do. But otherwise, yeah, you you can basically take all the pieces and install them. If you need a specific version of something, you can. But if you don't, you don't have to. But it's for using the software for development, not of developing of the software. Yeah. So is module feature based? different channels inside the DNS configuration. So we have different repos that you're pointing to mm -hmm. and that uh, DNS modules is dealing with, or is it implemented in another way uh, inside DNS? Yeah, so the question is, how is it implemented? Is it just mul is it um, multiple repos or is it some, something else? So it's everything one repo, because we believe that repo is like a source of software from a third party or from, from some entity, right? And you can have multiple modules in one repo, and it's implemented in a way that we have module definition that basically points to different packages and makes a group, something like comps group, but with additional things that make it work as modules. So everything is one repo. And I can show you details so, if you... So if everything is one repo when mm -hmm. you do DNS update, uh, so if you do, sorry, if you do RPM minus, uh, well, okay, if you download the package and you upgrade it, it will upgrade it. So you need to use DNS to not update Yes, I need to use DNF if I want to update and I want to make sure that everything works. Yeah, DNF knows what modules you have installed and then it just follows that the appearance for the module. Yeah? A quick double question. Are dependencies uh, part of the uh, stream? And what about if uh, two modules need the different versions of the same module? Mm -hmm. Good question. Are dependencies part of the module? And what happens if two modules need different dependencies? So. This really depends case of case. You can have dependencies in the module. You can have dependencies outside of the module if they're pretty common. And if two modules conflict, you can't install two. So you can only have one if they conflict, right? So this makes it, this makes it basically, um, you, you can't you, you gen in general, you can't <coughs> install all the modules at once because they would at some point conflict. Yeah. So yeah, I sure. Yeah, that's a good point. We call it, yeah, we say that it's parallel availability, not parallel installability. So you have multiple versions available, but you can only choose one of each module. And yeah, if there is another module that conflicts, you can install them in the same user space. But we figure that if people are using containers anyway, or in the enterprise model, right, it's just one app per user space. So it's one app per container, per VM, or per even <coughs> physical machine still. So that works in those cases. Mm -hmm. application that uses the stack, we go to the second line, so we have containers, you have a group of containers, which is called pod, that represent essentially the configuration you want to run. Right, yeah, there was a comment that, yeah, another way how, how I can build like a complex developer stack is, for example, to do something like Kubernetes, and I can make pod, which is like multiple yeah. containers for an application. Uh, yeah, but that, that, that's very alternative. Uh, we came from. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the back. Uh, how many packages would you Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you're next. You're next. Uh, okay. How does this work with like, software collections? How does it work with software collections? So, yeah. So I don't know if you know about software collections. Software collections are basically RPM packages that install things into separate parts. So you can install multiple versions of the same thing at once. So they proved some kind of hard to maintain, hard to use, because you need to manipulate the path. You need to change your application to use them. So in theory, you could put them into a module, but we don't do that. We figure that, anyway, people don't want multiple versions of the same thing in one user space. And that was causing more complication. Well, much more people don't want that. Few people do, but that's fine. They can still use that, or they can use containers, right? But the general use case was that people don't care about that, so we just <laughs> simplified it and using standard packages. But I can replace some of these cases of software collections. Yeah, there are many cases where people just use, install one just for the different versions, so that's even simpler for them right now. Right, next question. Uh, how many packages would you, would you like to like, version like this? I mean, you, show, you have shown uh, Node, and I can mm -hmm. imagine maybe Python, GCC, whatever. 
Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line and say we are providing um, that, like 500 packages with different versions, but not everything? I, I guess you cannot do everything. Right. So what? 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 How many versions of like how many packages do we want to provide uh, in modules? How far back do you go? Like, yeah. How yeah. how far can we go? So. That really depends on the community. So basically our team produces the technology and we help few people to produce some modules. But this is basically about the, uh, about the community, what they want. Um, you can go as far as GCC, but that would be kind of crazy because you have to, like if you have two versions of GCC, you need to have like two trays of everything, right? Yeah. Which is possible. Um, by the way, that, that reminded me, um, we have something called stream expansion, which means that if we build yeah. Let's say we have two versions of Fedora, we have two versions of language runtime, and two versions of applications. And if I just say I want to build everything against everything, it just build two versions of langu language runtime for each distro, and then two versions of application for each of those, and it kind of explodes. I can control it just to the combinations I really care about, but that's what you can do. So in theory, yes, I could do that, but I don't think there will be someone who really wants to maintain something like this. Yeah, um, that was first. Your second. So going back to, I think, Bruno's question, mm -hmm. um, so is, is there stuff you change on the spec file for uh, modularity to work? No. The, uh, the question was if there's something I change in the spec file of the RPM packages for modularity to work. No. There's no changes in the spec file. Okay. So going back to the pod thing, the, the, I think it's not an acceptable answer in mm -hmm. that um, you don't ship a pod. Uh, you no. You ship Helm charts or you ship CNAV or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, um, isn't that the promise of flat packs? Okay, so why, yeah, so <coughs> if flat packs should somehow fall into this, so yes, um, basically flat packs are, I don't know if anyone knows flat packs, these are like containers for graphical applications, and we have people in Fedora, um, at least one guy, who tries to build flat packs from RPMs, so yeah, the same software available as flat packs, um, so yeah, that's, that's the way to ship the software as well, so the benefit of modularity is that we have the software available to multiple deployments, so you can deploy just RPMs right on the machine. You can ship the container, you can ship a flat pack, you can even ship a VM, I don't know if people do that. Um, <coughs> but, but the benefit is you have the same thing across multiple levels of deployment. Yeah. And you said parallel availability, but not parallel uh, yeah. installation, that's right. Uh, so Nix does that, like I can switch between yeah. two versions of nodes. Yeah. Plans to for doing that in modularity? Yeah, so we have, uh, the question was, Parallel availability, not parallel installability, and for example, NixOS can do parallel installation. And if there are any plans to do that, um, no. So basically, that's a funny thing. When we started, we had this requirement, or like we made up this requirement: let's innovate and let's not make any changes, right? <laughs> so people are using RPM distributions, and on their laptops, in the data center, like if you have, for example, RHEL. It, like stock exchanges run on that, right? And in case it gets adopted, which it did even in rel a beta, um, we can't change it too much. So we need to stick to RPMs and we shouldn't make any changes that much, right? So if we started with nothing, we would probably do that, but we haven't started with nothing. We had to get some, somehow keep the RPM packages. But yeah, if, if you need something different, then maybe different distributions might help as well. Or containers, but yeah, these are basically RPM, and that's that was part of the, of the deal. Question? I just point out that in silver blue, um, flat packs are explicitly how you install applications. Yeah. So that, that it's sort of the use case for, for that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with silver blue, which is the desktop version of container OS, is flat packs is the mechanism how you install graphical applications in there. And there's even a repo and GNOME software, which is like an app store for GNOME. You can install flat packs directly in there. Yeah. But then flat packs are not patched through the OS <coughs> thing, right? No, flat packs are not in any way like connected with the OS tree, no. So it works like kind of like a phone. So you have the OS part, which is in this case the OS tree, and you update the OS, and then you have the application updates, which comes separately from whatever place you choose to consume them. My flat hub, for example. Is Upstream happy about all this stuff? Is Upstream happy about all this stuff? So that's the, that's the thing. Upstreams sometimes don't care that much. Sometimes do. And 
the why the, the reason why we have packaging is that AppStreams are really nice with developing new features, making interesting features and whatever, but they live in their own worlds, right? And if you want to run things like to build complex development environment or complex applications, they might somehow collapse or just don't work together. So that's why we have packaging. We have packaging guidelines to make sure that everything is packaged in a consistent way. So we have packages who actually just have opinions about where files are on the disk and then just like somehow reshuffle everything and make it work together. So these are very different worlds and these are very rarely the same person. So in principle, they shouldn't care. And if they're maintaining two versions, we consume the two versions, right? If, you, if they don't, we probably wouldn't somehow just take something and support it and like package it in Fedora. That would be, that would be weird. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we all know, for example, that in an ideal uh, Fedora Mozilla tree world, you'd have a Python 2 mm -hmm. stream and a Python 3 stream. Mm -hmm. And we all know that almost no one managed to jump from, from 2 to 3. <laughs> That's a very level. good question. You, so you, you have uh, apps which are... Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So what about Python, right? Python 2 and Python 3. These are usually on the same system at the same time. So Python is a special case. And we kind of have modules called Python 2 and called Python 3. So these are different modules because people need different Pythons. And they even went to extreme to have like module called Python 3.7, Python 3.6, so you can install all them at the same time. So they kind of abusing the system, but they are the exception to the rule. <laughs> Because well, hopefully, you have modules mm -hmm. and uh, developers only care about their own little part with their own little uh, dependence, their own little stack. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I, I fear that soon we'll have a well, little bit of uh, big apps that each depend on incompatible modules. Oh, right, yeah. So. Yeah, so what, what, what happens if this divergence goes too far and we have like large apps that depend on a different version of modules? So what we encourage is that you should consume the default whenever possible. So if there is a default version, you should really consume the default version and then you don't need to care about this. You need to have good reason to require an alternative version because exactly then it breaks for other applications, right? But on the other hand, if you really need to do that, you can do that. But yeah, of course, it's not magic that will somehow fix everything. But yeah, that's the recommendation. Just like if there is a default, try to use the default so it's not in conflict with everything else. But yeah, you can come to Fedora and package something really weird and just like include it and make sure that like it only works with nothing else. That, that, I, that's fine. If there is a use case for it, we, we can do it. But won't be the general case. Oh, by the way, we are um, doing discussions here. If, if people came just for the talk, I, I won't be offended if you leave. That's fine. If you're interested just in discussion, because I wanted to have like a little discussion here, um, you're very welcome to stay. Just don't want to pressure anyone to just like wait for the end. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you kill versions? Say I have uh, specifically yeah. the, the Node 8 stream. Mm -hmm. How do I kill versions? That's a very good question. So, for example, if Node.js 8 goes end of life, we are actually working on a mechanism which is almost done. Um, when we say that, for example, Node.js 8 ends in Fedora 30, and this is just made up thing. So we can just record this information, and the build system is clever enough to just stop building it after F30. Okay, but if it's installed on my system, it's on our grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I already have it installed on my system and I upgrade, what happens? So that's basically the same scenario what happens if a traditional package somehow dies in Fedora and just gets removed. It, it either stays on your system, but you will be prompted that, hey, this is out of life, so you should probably switch to something that's still maintained. Do you have any other questions? Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah? 
have two versions, right? Mm-hmm. And then you switch to the new one. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you only notice a couple of days later that something breaks. Yeah. Uh, how long do you keep the old version? And do you have multiple old versions? Good question. So when I update CoreOS or Silverblue and I have these snapshots, and so how long do I keep the old snapshots? So I always keep two. Well, the system always keeps two, and it keeps them forever. So as long as you do an update, it always keeps the previous one, so you can just go back whenever. But yeah, if you do two updates, only the one will be there right now. Any more questions, something to discuss? Um, all right, thanks for coming.